and allergy <coughs> control strategies, regulatory issues, new ingredients in medical foods, and interventional approaches using connecting devices. And we were trying to debate what connecting devices actually means among some of us. And uh, I'm going to interpret it as translational research and, and how we translate our findings into practical applications. And we'll get back to some of that, unless some of you have some other ideas of how we want to define connecting devices. But um, I want to welcome our panelists. And first of all, we have um, <coughs> Dr. Sarab Mehta, who comes to us from Cornell University, and Dr. Mehta is a physician and epidemiologist uh, with a background in expertise in infectious diseases, studying the interplay between nutrition and infection, and looking at issues related to the microbiome and associated uh, risk factors of infections and associated outcomes. He's worked in many parts of the world and uh, also is involved in a biotech company as well, which he alluded to. And I think that will become more interesting as we talk in this next session about how we bring these potential research findings to practical application. Next, we have uh, Dr. Sandra Einerhand. And Dr. Einerhand um, formerly has worked with Danone Nutrition Research uh, from the Netherlands and is a founder of Einerhand Science and Innovation, a consultancy which is providing um, direction to lead large scientific programs to bring new products like prebiotics, probiotics, lipids, and infant formula to the market with, which have scientifically proven health benefits, um, yielding uh, several patents as well. She has uh, come to us uh, with a former background as assistant and associate professor with Erasmus University and studying uh, the prevention and treatment of gastrointestinal diseases in children. Uh, next we have on our panel our former speaker from the French National Institute for Agricultural Research, the Institut National de Research uh, de Agronomique. And, um, <coughs> um, and uh, Dr. Uh, Bodnir has uh, researched cellular and animal models of uh, immunogens and allergens and has been involved also with national, uh, national products looking at pre prebiotics and the role of prebiotics. Uh, next, <clears throat> we have Dr. Patrice Millard. And uh, Dr. Millard comes to us working for H&H &H Group, which is based in China now. It's an international organization, which is also working on baby nutrition, personal care, uh, infant accessories, and looking at uh, aspects of um, um, bringing products to market in probiotics. He is the chief technology officer for the H&H &H Group. So with that, Thank you for participating. And um, we heard several talks today about research of allergens, uh, microbial agents, uh, both positive and negative, perhaps, in terms of its role in relation to nutrition. And some of the questions really become is, how do we actually study these particular type of uh, potential interventions in terms of a translational model? Um, and so why don't I just bring that up as a very general question first and have some general comments, and then we'll get into more specifics on that. So Dr. Mehta, would you like to start off? Um, sure. Uh, I find usually the general questions the most difficult to answer. <laughs> uh, but um, I think uh, I kind of alluded to at least in the microbiome perspective, or at least uh, for our, um, you know, the study that we are doing, the clinical trial with the biofortified foods, I think for it to be truly successful, it's only if it's, uh, if we find it to be efficacious and then it can be available to the larger community. So, and how do we go about that? That's a big challenge, of course. Uh, what what would we call efficacious? Is it just health? Do we stop at, can it modify the microbiome in a what we think is a healthy way? And so on, that's, those are questions up for debate. <coughs> Um, well, that's indeed a challenging question. I think um, uh, what in general 
is important is to understand what is actually the need. So the need from the mom, the need of the, of the infant. Uh, and, and if you understand what she understands um, uh, and what benefit uh, she's <coughs> after for her baby, then I think that's the starting point in how to design a potential preclinical and, cl and clinical program. Um, and of course, in the end, you have to clinically prove it. So the design of the clinical trial and in order to, you know, the right public power calculation uh, and the right d design, uh, of course, you have to prove that that benefit is really uh, substantiated clinically. And then subsequently with preclinical models, you could uh, uh, look for a potential mechanism <coughs> provided, of course, you have a benefit uh, by clinical studies. But in general, you know, that would be uh, the process start from the end. What is the need? And then go back to design your preclinical and clinical program. For, for allergy, this is exactly the same, finally. It's also, we, we don't have any cure or preventive strategy that are efficient currently. So it's really necessary to design strategy to prevent or to cure allergy. And uh, we have to test a strategy. So it can be nutritional strategy on model preclinical studies, so animal models. So what it's easy is to use mice. We use mice in the lab, but I know that there is there are a lot of different animal models that are also interesting. And after uh, it is, uh, it was my presentation. It's interesting, it's sure, to to go to the clinical trial to to demonstrate the effect of prevention or or therapy. That's mm -hmm. really important. Yeah, I think as, far as we are concerned, uh <coughs> for sure, the uh, the. Uh, um uh, the de development of the uh, gut microflora from uh, from babies is extremely important, and we uh, we uh, we know that we have a lot of evidence now that it's uh, it's uh, it's a key for the uh, for the immune system and for the pr pr protections on the of the babies. Uh, however, we are we are still a lot of uh, uncertainties uh, regarding uh, where these bacteria come from. Uh, do they come really from the breast milk? Uh, we have seen a lot of. Uh, Bacteria in breast milk, which are not bifidobacteria, for instance, but uh, uh, other bacteria, so it's not very clear. Uh, does it come really with from uh, from the systemic, uh, like uh, the, the the cord or, or, the, or the placenta, and so on? So a lot of in information there, <coughs> which is uh, extremely important. Also, we are coming back to the uh, to the allergy. We have a lot of questions. Also, how the allergy is developing? Really, is uh, is that uh, really the food allergy? Is that uh, Mediated directly by the food, or is or through the uh, or through the uh, the, the cutaneous uh, contact and uh, of the of the, the allergens. So, uh, so I think this all, all we have a lot of techniques today to, uh, to try to answer these questions, but a lot of pending questions still. Mm -hmm. Thank you, and uh, I apologize for giving such a broad question first, but it helped to bring out some of the other issues that some of you have discussed one of which is the role of animal studies in preclinical and, and models of such. And what are some of the best models that we have and how could they potentially be utilized and do they support enough evidence, as you're saying, to move on to more clinical studies? So I'll throw that out in general to anyone who wants to answer that. Animal models versus clinical and <coughs> Yeah, <coughs> again, uh, if we look at the, <coughs> the infant nutrition, uh, of course we can use a lot of uh, simple models, a uh, that can, can, can be used for several, like, uh, several applications. But uh, if you want really to be closer to, uh, to the what is the human uh, being, then uh, you have to use uh, piglet, for instance. And, uh, and you have even models of uh, preterm uh, pre piglets that you can, uh, you can use to, uh, to develop uh, Product for preterm or low birth rate uh, babies. So, uh, but of course, it's much more expensive than to use a rodent model. So, uh, we have to be careful wha what we do. <coughs> mm -hmm. Yes, Sancho. Yeah, I, I guess it's uh, it's it's really important to do the preclinical studies if you want to understand the mechanism of action, um, and uh, and it's also useful in a sense that you if you want to compare different ingredients or different products that you can look at it from a comparative point of view.
but of course, ultimately, you would have to do the clinical studies uh, in order to, to show that the benefit is really true in, in infants or in, uh, in pregnant or lactating uh, women, for that matter. Uh, and of course, there are very specific models that can help you uh, target uh, specific mechanisms. Uh, but of course, indeed, you know, there are examples that in animals, you know, the, the microbiota is different, the immune system uh, responds to different. So it, it is with a certain precaution that you can use the animal models, but to a certain extent they are useful. I think that we, we have also to, to use just at the beginning for the, secre for the screening, because when you have a lot of uh, nutrient to test, it's very difficult to do that in mice because you are a big, uh, big study. So I think it's also very important to develop in vitro models to demonstrate the effect, or the, the immune effect, the modification of the microbiota, but in in vitro <coughs> models. So I think that it's really also important to develop epithelial cell models, to develop um, immune cell models uh, and microbiota in vitro to test the effect. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I think um, I totally agree with it. I don't have much to add to that, but uh, really um, what we have found useful is establishing partnerships with people who do basic science work, on uh, because we are in the population science side, but have an ongoing partnership, because it's not like preclinical, then hands off to clinical. I think especially in this, for example, in microbiome work, we are seeing more and more that we have to go back and forth multiple times, and then uh, test some hypotheses, like the Malawi study that I mentioned, bringing mm -hmm. the fecal transplants from the kids, and then putting them in mice, and then seeing what that differences are. And that's kind of what has changed our perspective also, that in our Mumbai study, we were using rectal swabs, but we realized how important it would be to be able to do some of those studies. So we have established a collaboration for our second study where we are going to actually do stool samples and do a material transfer agreement, but that's a separate issue. Mm -hmm. uh, so, um, uh, so I think that kind of an ongoing collaborative model and where there is a fair amount of back mm -hmm. and forth uh, rather than a single stream, I think is more yeah. and more important. You bring up some interesting points here because usually when a new drug is developed, it's usually animal models first and then it goes to humans. Whereas here, p as you're mentioning, it's almost back and forth. And we already have the natural experiments of eating yogurt and other probiotics uh, uh, historically. And so how do you actually test the effect? So what has been your experience with talks with uh, regulatory agencies, EMEA and the FDA, on some of these issues in terms of what do they consider to be appropriate models for uh, showing safety and efficacy, especially if we're talking about fermented foods and other items? Well, I think these are uh, <coughs> very uh, key uh, problems, uh, especially when we talk about uh, uh, the immune system or the allergy. Um, uh, if you want to, to, to have claims on the, on the it's, uh, most of the time it's not possible because you are a food product, so you are not a drug, so you are not uh, supposed to have claims, but at least that you, uh, you, you, you have some, uh, some, uh, some regulators in different countries, like for instance, if we take China, we have, uh, we have something which is between the food and the drug, which is a functional food, so you can have some claims on certain food products, like you have in Australia or in, Can in uh, Canada as well. So, um, and the problem is that uh, there is no, uh, for the regulator, I think there is no very clear um, setup or, or experiment that show that this product is really good for balancing the immune system. So there is no standard for this. And I think that is l really lacking because uh, uh, on, on, on the regulator cannot really uh, answer any question about it. They cannot say, oh, it's good or not because mm -hmm. they, they don't want to take any risk. And uh, you don't have any, you cannot provide a real uh, sound <coughs> protocol that show, okay, that everybody, all the scientists agree that this is a protocol to show that this product is good for balancing the immune system, in a, especially in sensitive population like babies or, or, or even uh, uh, pregnant women. So I think this is still uh, something that we should, as scientists, look at it and uh, try to work on. That's my uh, opinion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a million dollar question, I guess. Uh, it's, it's really difficult uh, from a regulatory point of view, um, uh, especially in the European uh, Union uh, situation. Um, 
of course, there is some guidance from EFSA, but they're not giving advice in how you design your trial and how you should design it in order to get a, a, a benefit uh, clinically proven, unfortunately. Um, and also, you know, with regard to, so there is um, information, especially in the area of immune, it's very difficult to, uh, to get this guidance from the regulatory uh, uh, authorities. Uh, in other areas like gut health, uh, it's slightly more uh, easy. Um, uh, for instance, also with regard to probiotics, the word probiotic in itself is already considered a health claim. Um, and uh, to date, no health claim has been approved uh, in the area of probiotics. And so probiotics and immune are both areas that are quite challenging in the European uh, uh, context. Um, so it's indeed uh, quite quite difficult uh, at the mm -hmm. moment uh, to design and to have this um, uh, proven benefit. Yep. Okay. No, thank you. Um, <coughs> so one of the questions I had from the immunological and antigen exposure is what is the role of natural co-evolution of, of humans with their the microbes that we live with at various different ages and their impact as allergens, both pro and negative in our systems. Um, frequently, we co-evolved with microbes to get infected at an early age, which is beneficial because, for example, getting infected at a later age is more harmful when we have a more competent immune system. The same thing could potentially be said for allergens. And so what are your feelings and thoughts about the co-evolution of our cells with allergens and whether or not we're living in too clean an environment or not, a, not clean enough. So the hygiene hypothesis is uh, really in correlation with uh, the allergy, that's true. Uh, the best, the real difficulty is the allergen sensitization. When exactly, w at what period you can be sensitized by an allergen. So. The we call about uh, atopic March, so we think that the beginning of the allergy could be uh, skin sensitization, and after uh, an intranasal or an oral sensitization. So this is the March of allergy, and what we 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 observe is that at the beginning of the life, children are more atopic, uh, are more um, have more eczema or atopic dermatitis, then we observe more food allergy, and then at adolescents and adults, we observe more asthma. So this is a march of allergy, allergies. But what is very difficult is to know when you are sensitized to an allergen, because some study that introduce, uh, for example, egg allergen, this is a study, a uh, step study of, uh, of Suzanne Prescott. They introduce eggs at four months of age to induce tolerance, and we intru they introduce eggs every day to induce tolerance. And they observed that children at four months of age, before uh, exposure to eggs, have as um, Ig against ovalbumin, against eggs. So we think that these children have been sensitized before. So is it the breastfeeding? Is it during uh, pregnancy? So we don't know that exactly when you are sensitized. Or you can be sensitized by skin contact because your baby, when he's at table with you, he can, he can be in contact with food. So we don't know exactly the beginning, finally, of the sensitization. So we have to understand these mechanisms. Yeah, I think it's uh, extremely interesting because, <coughs> sorry, because yes, the sensi sensitization is, uh, is is something which is uh, more and more uh, uh, evident because we have more and more uh, uh, allergy and uh, you know, for for babies. Like if we, I don't know exactly the, the prevalence of atopy uh, today, but it's probably fifteen percent or something like this, right? Or maybe more? No. Uh, yeah. So, uh, so we have more of this uh, uh, allergic, and, mm, and we know that there are a lot of uh, correlation, of course, with uh, C-sections 
on the non breastfeeding but for the for the food allergy for instance the the, the, the prevention of uh, of the uh, of the breastfeeding is not very clear it's not mentioned that uh, because you breastfeed you are you will decrease the the risk of uh, of uh, food allergy so uh, so it's it's, uh, it's very clear uh, i think that the the skin is uh, is uh, one vehicle one one, uh, one organ that can vehicle the uh, the allergens and it's 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 a on 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 the fact that the babies if they are born by C-sections, they are not naturally covered by the vaginal uh, uh, lactobacilli, but by the uh, hospital environment, uh, is probably also something which we have to take care of because very early there will be uh, the, the dendritic cells, the longer on cells and so on, they will take, uh, uh, let's say, antigens that are not very good. So, uh, on so that on it's, it, it's an interesting story because in China, for instance, <coughs> in certain of hospitals, <coughs> before C-sections, uh, the nurse d d can take the, uh, the vaginal uh, 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 populations by uh, putting uh, uh, tissues into the vagina, and then after delivery, they, they cover the baby with the uh, with the mm -hmm. tissues to uh, to seed the uh, lactobacilli on the on the skin. So I think it's the we have to learn something about it. Mm -hmm. that the skin is probably going to be uh, much more important in the sensitization than we, we thought before. Mm. But uh, for that, uh, we, we, we haven't observed any uh, difference of um, allergy in the future. In if we compare um, a pregnancy uh, delivery sorry, by C-section or uh, by natural delivery, there is no difference. For food allergy? No, not for allergies in general. We don't observe any difference, and uh, we don't observe any. Uh, we observe difference of uh, microbiota, or microbiome. We can say more uh, microbiome uh, difference at the beginning of the life, but after after uh, one or two months, this is exactly the same microbiome between the two population, depending on delivery. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> that's confusing. Just a couple of points to add. It's uh, uh, we were talking about dietary diversity, and uh, of course, uh, oh, not dietary diversity. I was talking about <laughs> the gut microbiota diversity, and uh, um, how that um, we uh, there are studies that have shown that increased hygiene decreases that, and that leads to increased risk of allergies and autoimmune diseases. And I, I think also the case of peanut butter is a good uh, kind of an example or a case study that how the stand around exposing kids to peanut butter has changed over the last mm -hmm. few years. Okay. So I, l I have a habit of asking some controversial questions, so <coughs> I'll, I'll put it two forward to you. Um, to veterinarians, a antibiotics are growth promoters. To, um, so to humans, potentially, it's a growth promoter as well, but it also has other impacts on antimicrobial resistance. So what are your thoughts and feelings of uh, antibiotics as a, a as a function of looking at it as a growth promoter versus probiotics and its potential role. Uh, <coughs> I mean, it's very clear, like for instance, for animal feed, then uh, of course the, the, the uh, antibiotics that were used as growth, pro growth promoter for, 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 the, uh, for, for breeding animals uh, have been suppressed in Europe for maybe uh, 15 years ago or something, I don't remember exactly, uh, but replaced by probiotics. Okay, so you have probiotics that are used for animal feed, and the outcome of these probiotics is really that you have a better growth of the animals. So I suppose that uh, that the use of probiotics is also something that can Im impact the growth of the human. Interesting question uh, and provocative, like you said. Um, I guess the, the work from Martin Blazer, uh, among others, uh, really looked at at uh, impact of antibiotics on later life health and uh, you know of course you disturb the microbiota in early life uh, especially if you do this in preterm uh, born kids uh, and that correlates to later life risk of obesity uh, so adiposity but also other risks uh, of non-communicable diseases so clearly disturbing early life microbiota uh, uh, may have impact for later life uh, health um, and then indeed looking at how can you intervene in such cases. 
of course, an obvious uh, possibility would be uh, to add uh, probiotics, but of course they will also be harmed by giving antibiotics. So I guess it's to s potentially it could work, uh, but I guess uh, you know you have to uh, see for what reason the antibiotics are given and for what with what probiotics you subsequently have to intervene in order to not destroy your antibiotic uh, effect. Okay. So the next <coughs> potential politically charged question, not necessarily to you, but just to the overall environment, is um, the role of evidence in one way or another in the respective view of GMOs in both the U.S. and in Europe. And what is the evidence one way or the other in terms of it, is this a political issue? Is it a regulatory issue? Is it based on evidence one way or another? And uh, thoughts and feelings of, of that from a regulatory perspective. If any, want to respond to that. Well, I have my theory on this. Uh, <coughs> uh, the GMO, if, if we look at the... Uh, <coughs> Sorry. If we look at the um, other technology on the on the um, on mostly the benefits, uh, wh why people don't don't accept GMO today is that they don't see any benefits. Okay, so why 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 should I take any risk if I don't have any benefits? We are human being, right? We we always trade out between risk and benefits. So uh, there is no benefits. Even sometimes the farmers they don't see any benefits to use uh, GMO crops on something like this. So uh, but. If we can see benefits, then in that case mm -hmm. there will be. I think uh, there is, uh, you know, there, there is no 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 risk. Uh, <coughs> we have a lot of uh, product issues uh, from uh, from GMO, like uh, I don't know insulin or other one. And, uh, so uh, without any risk for the for the people. So is that a political issue or a regulatory issue for Europe? I'm not. I think I'm actually, a, I'm not even I sure. Think it's a, it's a <coughs> social issue, political issues okay. more than regulatory issues. I think. Okay. Yeah, for the Europe European situation, I guess it's the same. It's more a, a perception um, mm -hmm. and a fear from uh, from uh, people uh, that they don't know exactly what a GMO is, um, and you know you insert something or and you're not exerting something specific. You're always adding something else, um, and that's the fear. What then? What consequences it, it does uh, have? And of course, with the new technology of CRISPR Cas, of course, your genetic modification. Um, capabilities are much more precise nowadays, so I think in the future it potentially could be possible, but I guess the fear from uh, trying to explain it to a broader audience and to uh, consumers, at least w in Europe and the US probably the situation is slightly different, um, the perception is still, well, we don't like the fact that you're adding GMOs, mm -hmm. um, even though from a health point of view there is not a clear uh, reason to be fearful, but apparently that's still the situation. So it's mm -hmm. more uh, an emotional aspect than a political or a uh, regulatory issue. Okay. Yeah, and I would just add that uh, uh, whatever the evidence says or doesn't say and what my opinion is, regardless of that, it's um, uh, in the countries that we are working in, especially with biofortified crops, we can't do these trials unless we uh, give them a certificate that uh, these are non-GMO. We had, we had uh, the, the same issue recently with the HMO, right? With human milk oligosaccharides. There are molecules that we know for years. Right? Uh, <laughs> and, uh, <coughs> and then the way to produce them now by biotechnology, and using, of course, recombinant yeast or bacteria to produce them, uh, but this product is not classified as a, as a GMO product. It's, it's issue from GMO technology or something. But it was a lot of, uh, of course, concern by the industry, especially for the infant, infant formula industry, how you can use this kind of product, okay? Mm -hmm. How you are going to communicate and how the agencies are going to, to think about it. Fortunately, I think the, US, the USDA and the, and the EFSA now have, uh, have cleared this, uh, these situations and it's uh, is good and we have already product on the market. But uh, I think for China, for instance, still the question is, uh, is a little bit uh, concerned on how they are going to, uh, to see that because of some bad perceptions in the past of a uh, product that has been considered as GMO and uh, that was uh, going to put 
a lot of burden on the uh, on the on the society. So uh, we have to uh, we have to consider that. But as a <coughs> as a uh, as a industry and uh, on scientists, we have to push this technology because definitely, if we want, for instance, in infant formula to develop new generations in the futures, again, that it will be based on mostly mimicking as much as possible what is present in human breast milk. So that means that uh, you have to uh, isolate some proteins and copy genes and so on to, to be able to produce better infant formula uh, that can sustain also the immune system. So, uh, so I think that these technologies are extremely important for the future, so we have to, uh, we have to move on, on as, a, as a global uh, as a global industry and scientists in uh, in uh, in pushing uh, pushing this way. Mm -hmm. In the context of allergy concerning a GMO, uh, I think that uh, at uh, European level uh, there are different groups of work that try to design the best uh, preclinical model to be sure to test the allergenicity of uh, GMO. So we can wait for results. <laughs> okay. It's okay. So um, <coughs> let me ask a, a question about if you have a new probiotic, new material, what would be the, I'm not sure the best way to ask, ask this, the, the, the regulatory pathway that you would choose to pursue in the most timely way? What would, what would your strategy be? Yes. Uh, zero experience in this. Uh, so, uh, um, but if, I mean, uh, we have been, um, the only experience that we have is because of the biotech stuff that we have this diagnostic startup. So we have been, you know, I've been knee deep in uh, trying to figure out uh, FDA regulations and so on and so forth around diagnostics. But um, as a corollary, I've also had a chance to look at some of the therapeutic stuff and how we'll have to go about doing an investigational new drug and all that, and what the kind of sample size and what kind of clinical studies will be needed to follow that. But beyond that, I'm sure there are other people in this room who have a lot more experience in the regulatory framework for a de developing a new drug and getting it convinced of that. Yeah, with regard to uh, pre and probiotics, uh, I guess uh, at the moment it's probably going to be easier uh, prebiotic. Uh, but I guess for it, it really depends on um, what target population? So, if it's for allerg allergic uh, uh, patients, you're following in the European context probably the FSMP route, the, so the food for special medical purposes, um, and um, and then of course it's it's really to demonstrate the benefit. Uh, and like I said, with regard to immune parameters and what is a valid biomarker and what what are the benefits that you're going to to demonstrate. Um, it's it's going to be quite challenging, uh, mm -hmm. even for a prebiotic, to demonstrate uh, this in the regulatory context in the EU. Uh, probably it's going to be easier in other countries to get uh, to get a claim. Um, but I guess um, if you um, uh, design the clinical trial according, and there are guidelines from EFSA mm -hmm. already in the area of immune, <coughs> um, then if you follow these, um, it's and connect also to, uh, to uh, the, you know, the different stakeholders in order to be informed, okay, what is the best clinical design? Um, it is possible to get uh, via the FSMP route uh, a beneficial uh, and proven benefit, and that's already demonstrated because there are already products on the market. Um, but indeed, uh, the situation, if you want to go beyond FSMP and demonstrate a benefit for healthy uh, infants, that's going to be much more challenging because how do you prove a benefit in a population that's already healthy? Uh, and EFSA also doesn't give you clear guidance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, d d I fully agree with what you, you said. Uh, if we look at the probiotics, we have to uh, separate what is the, the food probiotics, the, the classical probiotics based on, uh, on food, uh, food, uh, food bacteria. So on the and from the new generation that can uh, uh, pop up in the future that are more uh, uh, biotherapeutic bacteria, mm -hmm. and for which the U.S. already have uh, a clear guidelines to make uh, this product register as a, as a drug. So uh, I think uh, EMEA is still uh, lagging behind that uh, for the time being. 
but probably will move on this direction as well because a lot of new uh, therapeutic drugs can uh, can happen uh, with uh, with uh, with specific uh, probiotic bacteria that are not food grade. So actually, okay. So here's another controversial question. Um, France is a very dairy-oriented country and makes yogurt. Yogurt or kimchi? <laughs> <coughs> we, just had, we just had the Olympics in Korea, and kimchi was designated as a very healthy probiotic. Well, I, I, th I think it's, a, it's not very true, because if you eat kimchi, you have a lot of nitrate inside, and this is, this is very detrimental to, to health. So I don't, <laughs> don't think that uh, kimchi is a, Well, probably to isolate some strains for probiotic, probiotic strains, it's probably a good source. But to eat kimchi every day, is, uh, I think, is uh, not very good for health. Because of nitrate content, yes. Well, nitrate. nitrate, yes, okay. very high content. Mm -hmm. Okay. No, no other comments. Okay. <laughs> All right. We'll um, <coughs> we'll go ahead and we'll open this up to the general audience. And yes. Yes, I have. Um, <coughs> please I have introduce a, yourself. Before I'm you speak. Serge Rizzi. I'm working for Nestle Institute of Health Sciences, okay. and uh, I'm not a microbiologist and. Uh, I would like to know whether we know how microbiome works at a molecular level, listening from the experts. And um, I have two questions, basically. What's the likelihood um, that the same population of gut bugs do show different metabolism, de depending on the microenvironment, the trophic factors they receive from diet? And the second question is what, what, what the panel knows about where we stand uh, versus the uh, metagenomics approaches, which promised us to, you know, at least help us understanding the function of this complex ecosystem. Yeah, so I'm not sure I can answer all of your uh, uh, question, uh, questions there, but uh, I think uh, the approaches are now available to analyze both as I pointed out, that uh, what the microbiome, microbiota can do and then what they're actually doing. So what the current recommendation is, if there are resources, we shall be able to uh, not only define what the composition is, what the functional capacity is, but then also what the actual function in that context is. And uh, uh, so the approaches are there, but it's, of course, with each level of complexity, it gets also more expensive. And then we are still talking about as was pointed out, we are still talking about rectal microbiota, and we are still talking about a snapshot in time, and this is a continuously kind of an adapting organ in a way, which, you know, some of the limited studies with dietary interventions have shown that it changes within one day. So what does that really mean, and how are we measuring it, and how often shall we be measuring it? I think it's still pretty nascent. Yeah, I'm not sure I can also answer very clearly your, your question, but uh, uh, actually we, we uh, it, it, it's very likely that we have uh, uh, different populations that can do about the same thing in the gut, that means producing short-chain fatty acid, which is uh, the most, uh, most important, uh, uh, of course, metabolite that they can produce. Um, and so uh, we are, we are I think that we having just uh, the picture of the microbiota without having the correlation with the uh, met, uh, with the metabolite that they are producing uh, is uh, is not enough, and we know that we have the genetic background of the of the of the people e even uh, so uh, that you have for instance uh, people that are methano excreter and so we are not methano excreters so you have a lot of differences in genetics that can explain also the fact that uh, you have uh, for the same population of bacteria maybe different things so uh, so I think it's not uh, not simple uh, answer but it's uh, it's probably linked to these uh, two things. Yes? Please introduce yourself. Deanne Liskin with BioFortis. And we heard earlier with Ken Brown uh, the discussion about needing or wanting to go toward <coughs> biomarkers and blood tests. And then we think about microbiota and the food for the gut are molecules that we don't necessarily see in the blood. So when you look at studies and you think of how do you assess the dietary intake and the food, which would be like fibers and phytonutrients, et cetera, in terms of microbiota, how do you, what do you think are the best methods going forward to try to understand that connection with, in especially low-income countries? Um, 
not sure I completely got the question, but uh, um, I think uh, there are certain, definitely there are certain functions of the microbiota that we can look at as, uh, uh, based on those functions, we can predict that there are going to be certain things in the blood, for example, or there are certain things that can be biomarkers of how active that microbiota is, like short-chain fatty acids that might be only resulting from digestion of resistant starch. So we can measure those and predict something like that. Is that kind of getting at what? Yeah, I'm, I'm just asking the question of do we need to keep with diet diaries and these sorts of tools for now, or will do you foresee that we would be able to do some kinds of blood tests that would tell you something about the microbiota of food, for instance? So some kind of a blood uh, test to predict what somebody ate? Yeah. Mm -hmm. ah, I think so. Well, I guess it's it's going to be important to you know not only look at okay how did microbiota shift, you know that that's one thing, but it doesn't necessarily give you a benefit. I think in order to understand what the benefit is, so the health benefit, I think it's the meta metabolomics, you know what metabolites, and trying to associate that to a physiological function uh, or a health benefit in the end, which will be the trick whether that's measuring it in biomarker in, in blood or in the features, you know, that's to be determined. But I guess this is the, the important link. If you give a fiber, you will affect the microbiota. What does that mean with regard to metabolites <coughs> uh, and then correlated to a physiological function or a benefit? And that's, of course, challenging. But I think with the current tools, uh, not only looking at the microbiome, uh, microbiota, but looking also at the metabolomics uh, and then correlated to physiological function in animals or in humans, that's going to be the trick. Mark? Yes, uh, Mark Bonville, Institut Mérieux. Uh, I had uh, two questions. The first one is uh, regarding uh, the working hypothesis and possible immune marker that could be used actually to assess the effect of uh, prebiotics on allergic status. I remember cell paper a year ago or two years ago suggesting that, for instance, there was a straightforward uh, immune biomarker like, for instance, uh, allergen-specific T cells that could be readily detected in any individuals and that you had the possibility perhaps based on the balance between regulatory versus affected T cells against this particular antigen to identify actually the actual immune status against a particular antigen. So I don't know whether in your case you have the possibility to do that. It might be technically very challenging. Whether you have a working hypothesis suggesting that some bacteria that whose growth is promoted by your prebiotics trigger actually either an effector or a regulatory response, and uh, and whether you have, based on this working hypothesis, the possibility actually to have a more reliable surrogate marker of efficacy. Yes. So in the clinical trial that we will uh, we have designed, uh, we will uh, check uh, immune system. We will check uh, Th1, Th2, T regulatory cells, and specific to. Uh, different allergen and non-specific to see the balance. And uh, we'll check that in the mother, but we'll check that in the baby at one year of age, and we will check also in the cord blood, because we will have cord blood. So we will develop tests, Im immune tests, to have access to uh, the TH phenotype. Sure. We will also check the ability of innate cells can say innate because we will stimulate with um, uh, TLR, TLR ligand to stimulate TLR ligand receptor, so to have access to the TLR receptor, so the response to, to mic microbes uh, in general, to the human immune system of children and mother, so and in the cord blood also, we we'll check that. And uh, in this study, we will check uh, the composition of the microbiota in the mother, in the child. And uh, we have statisticians. We hope that we'll maybe they will uh, 
have to make the correlation with uh, immune system analyze and microbiota analyze. But it will be difficult to see, yes, uh, this bacteria is increased and maybe there is a correlation and an activation of T regulatory cells like that. It will be difficult to, to, have, uh, to respond to this question. I have a, a, a completely different question now. Because you, you, you raised the issues regarding the use of probiotics, how to uh, exploit a microbiota signature to, uh, for instance, possibly predict a particular outcome. And um, I always think of this, uh, uh, the situation of premature babies that are predisposed to uh, uh, necrotizing enterocolitis. Mm -hmm. And uh, typically, it's a situation where, from what I understood from the literature, you have poss the possibility, perhaps, to identify pre predictive signatures. You have the possibility to treat these premature infants with particular probiotics, particularly bifidobacteria. Or, and so I, I don't know how feasible is it, whether it's a, a, a relevant model actually to, to really uh, uh, identify some uh, uh, microbiota signature that would lead actually, that would show an actual added medical value. And I think that that's what we are currently missing in this, uh, in this field, is uh, um, situations, clinical situations, where uh, a predictive signature will show actual medical value actually handling these premature babies. So I don't know where, what's your feeling about this, whether you follow this uh, literature and uh, how strong are the data that has been uh, published so far. Well, I, I think some of the data that I presented was like, you know, the proteobacteria, <coughs> for example, or the composition definitely is different in necrotizing enterocolitis or in premature babies. So now how much of that is predictive versus a function of what they have at that time that data so far is missing, but I'm sure that data can is eventually going to be generated depend as more and more studies are done in that area. Because we we mentioned, yeah, you discussed before the possible impact of environmental microbiota and early exposure to this environmental microbiota on possibly the health status of the kid at later time points. Mm -hmm. So seemingly there is no impact of environmental microbiota on allergies, but is there an impact on immune maturation, defense against uh, further infections? And we, expect, we are hypothesizing that. I am not sure that we have con conclusive evidence to say that. Uh, we're definitely hypothesizing that based on all the uh, evidence around and how the gut is uh, this largest immune organ and how the gut and uh, the microbiota and the immune system are kind of co-developing or co-evolving over the first yeah. couple of years, first few years of life, um, we are definitely saying that it has a big role in uh, predicting and preventing possibly childhood infections. But uh, I think the evidence is just beginning to come together on some of those things. So there are like, um, I think there are um, just a handful of studies, like the ones that I presented, where they are showing some conclusive links. Yeah, and t maybe maybe uh, to uh, to add to this, I think you know, looking at preterm babies, they're born prematurely for a reason. So mm. yes, in principle, of course they're monitored, and and uh, you know you can measure a lot of things within the preterm setting because they're in the NICU, so they are monitored anyway. Um, so in that sense, it's a good to look at preterm babies. But on the other hand, you have to be mindful of the fact they are, of course, born with, uh, for a reason, uh, prematurely. Uh, and they are often also uh, treated with antibiotics, which obviously will, will affect uh, the maturation of the, <coughs> the microbiota and the colonization of the microbiota in the gut. Um, so there are pros and cons of, of looking at preterm. But of course, and the other factor that plays a role is that in many countries in the world, they are already given <coughs> probiotics uh, because you know there are already quite some studies done uh, mm. using probiotics in in preterms, and sp depending on which probiotic, they have been shown to be uh, effective. Uh, so uh, more and more NICUs are using probiotics already as a mm. standard practice. So 
Yeah, I think uh, also just to, to add on, on what you are saying, uh, it depends also very much on the, when we talk about preterm babies, uh, how preterm they are, right? Yeah. Because yeah. there are also some uh, some controversial uh, studies showing that maybe administration of uh, probiotics to a very, very early yeah. uh, preterm, like uh, 22 uh, weeks and so on, is, is maybe not that 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 good uh, for for Nick. So, uh, but uh, I agree that a lot of uh, setup now are using uh, probiotics uh, for, for prevention of uh, necrotizing arteriocolitis. But the question is always the same, is which strain, uh, how much, and how long? So uh, on we are not able to answer this question very clearly at this moment. Mm. Yes. Yes, Matthias uh, Shamayar at the INSERM. Uh, we are still quite far uh, from having uh, an algorithm that can predict the host benefit of a signature, but uh, I would like to get your comment on circadian biology. The time of sampling for each of the, 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 the stools or other uh, samples they were uh, used to microbiota analysis and and because there is some fluctuation at least in, in some studies they show fluctuation in the composition of the microbiota according to the time of the day mm -hmm. and definitely the benefit at if different time point of the day is uh, we could anticipate that this timing of sampling is important mm -hmm. to discover uh, different type of benefits to the host at different time of the day. So what could be your comment on these uh, studies? Do, do we now need to invest uh, 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 strong efforts in monitoring the microbiota at different time for looking at specific benefits to the host? What's your feedback? Maybe uh, you are maybe are familiar with second biology. I think that's a complicated issue. So that's why it was such a long list of limitations in my uh, talk around both the methodology and the sign of it. Uh, and that's a main issue around the microbiome that it's, uh, as we have said earlier, that it's a continuously adapting kind of a living organism. So what time of the day, how soon, how frequently do we want to measure it? I think that's a lot of standardization across uh, the, the whole community that is working in this area that needs to happen. Sorry, I don't know that's not really satisfying. Mm -hmm. Do we have any other questions out there? Okay, I'm going to pose something. <clears throat> if you had a message to engage the regulators or funders of this type of research, what would you? What would your message be? Challenging question. I guess um, what I often hear is that uh, the guidance, so what is, it would be helpful, and I know that we have discussed it over and over again, um, uh, a guidance from EFSA before you actually engage in clinical trials. So it's sort of a pre-assessment panel, you know, are we doing the right, right thing? Because over and over, it's a question, I think the, the studies that are being done are with the aim to, to get a claim or get a health benefit proven and uh, accepted by the regulation. But it's the, yeah, the lack of clear guidance, that's the block and that's the hurdle. Um, mm. And this pre-assessment or this upfront advice, that's the challenge. I think if there would be a possibility, and it all has to, in the end, uh, have to do with money, to Im invest in such a pre-assessment panel, but that could be a way uh, <coughs> at least to, to promote innovation and to help um, the academia and the companies to do uh, clinical trials that in the end will lead to a benefit that's accepted by the regulations. Yeah, I, I would uh, I would uh, follow what you say and, uh, and also uh, I like that um, the Allergy is uh, is developing uh, about everywhere now, so it's not uh, it's not a small uh, small things that we have to cope <laughs> with, and uh, that means that the uh, regulator have to take that into a very strong uh, account, and uh, not always uh, let the uh, everybody doing what they want about it. If you, uh, when I say that, it's because uh, uh, when we look at uh, uh <coughs> the, the the messages that go to the public. 
uh, today. Like for instance, gluten-free product. You have gluten-free product everywhere, right? Uh, you go to Anaheim in uh, Natural Product Expo West, and then you see a bunch of product for gluten-free. Is, is that so critical that we have, uh, that the gluten is now uh, allergen? No, probably not. So we, we are not very clear on the also the message that we have to convey to the, to the public. But uh, for the real uh, things that we know today on the, on the risk of allergy, then we have to be stronger with the authorities and uh, say that we have to, to solve that by the food and by the situation, that not by the drug. And then uh, we have to, uh, to find solutions to clearly document this product. I, I think also that it's really important to understand more the mechanisms during uh, perinatal periods because we don't know exactly uh, the exchange between the mother or the fetus at uh, microbiota level, but immune factor, so we don't know all these things. And uh, I think it will be very interesting to know exactly the interaction at this stage, but also the interaction uh, during breastfeeding. We we talked to together about uh, skin skin contact during uh, breastfeeding. That's that's really really important, and I think that uh, we have also more to understand the different microbiome and the characterization of the microbiome in all the body, especially for example placenta. It's not really clear currently if there is a. Uh, a, a real uh, microbiome in the placenta, that's true or not? I don't know, I can maybe you have a, an idea about that, but uh, so I think that we need more also, more information on all these uh, actors um, that are involved in non-communicable disease in general. So this period of life for me is very critical for the rest of your life, so. Can I just I'm yes. here? <laughs> yes, go ahead. Please. Thank you. Just regarding the uh, um, regulatory uh, bodies, uh, I'm sorry, I'm Muriel Casobial from Biofortis uh, Marion Nutri Sciences, and we are conducting clinical trials in nutrition, especially, and in this field of probiotic, uh, prebiotics, uh, postbiotics, uh, and microbiota analysis. And um, really, with um, regulatory bodies, uh, now we, we have a, a real issue um, related to the uh, uh, regulatory status of new products. Uh, when we want to conduct clinical trials in this field regarding the immune, uh, immune system, for instance, in infants or in, uh, elderly people, and if we want to, to perform clinical trials in several uh, European uh, countries, for example, in one country, um, the authorities uh, say, okay, this product is a food product, no problem for me, you can perform the clinical trial the way you have decided to. And it, in another country, uh, <laughs> the, the, the body say, uh, no, no, it, for me, it's a medication, no way, this protocol is not, uh, is not uh, correct for us. You have to, uh, to declare this protocol as a medication one and so on. So it's very, very com complicated to perform clinical trial on a large manner in, in this regulatory uh, uh, status. Very, very complicated. So the first one is, is please, please clarify the status of these products. If, we, if you want that, we, we continue clinical research and we continue this research ne necessary to understand the mechanism of action and uh, so on. And of course, I agree with the EFSA guidance uh, related to, to the design of the protocol, but um, <laughs> I'm quite uh, disappointed for the moment. We have asked uh, several times to, uh, to submit some design or synopsis to be sure that we are on the right way. And this is uh, not uh, a lot for the moment. Yeah, I guess you uh, answer your own question. I guess, uh, so you, in, when I said um, you have to start from the end, what is the, the, the need um, from the mother and the, and, the ben and the baby's point of view, I guess it's also, uh, I have to add then, it's also important to understand for which market um, so is it going to be this one country or that country? And what you see is that the way um, uh, uh, 
people go about and uh, private companies, probably also academia that, that work with private uh, um, uh, institutes, um, really look at, okay, if it's going to be this market, we'll have to design the study according to that market. So the, the product development is going to be much more targeted um, uh, for market, population, and it's also what you see in the regulatory stage. Although I understand, you know, the larger the market, the more profitable it will be. But in the end, I think from a regulatory point of view, probably you're going to be um, forced, or, or maybe not only forced, uh, it has a reason for it, uh, to be much more targeted um, for that matter. Yeah, I agree, but uh, it's not so simple for the moment, I guess. No, and for <laughs> that I, I totally agree with that. Yes. Uh, Colette Short, Johnson & Johnson. Um, I think we need to look at not just the product. So it's not just whether it's a probiotic or a prebiotic, but also the intended purpose of the product and the claim language that goes with the product. So, and this would happen in many companies, I think, at a very, very early stage. So um, at that point, I think that a product can be either a drug or a food or an FSMP, um, and, and that's irregardless of whether it's a prebiotic or probiotic. Um, but I think the key importance is to bring in regulatory very early in the, in the stage of the development of any product in this area. And I think on a positive side from EFSA, um, the opportunity is there for uh, claims in this area in healthy individuals. And as Sandra said, I totally agree with her. They have outlined um, the, the pathway, I think. They have stipulated some biomarkers in this area that they, they have accepted. I think there's a dearth <laughs> of validated markers in the whole immune area. And I think it's very positive if we look at the FDA. They have <coughs> already um, approved um, a qualified claim in this area. So I, I think we can be quite positive, but we do need the evidence. We do need good regulatory um, information at the very start of projects. Um, and oftentimes, products are developed, and then <coughs> people start thinking, oh, how do we translate this and bring it into the market? I think what, what, what I've learned is you need to do that day one, right? Because it depends if it's a traditional probiotic, if it's a novel probiotic. The regulatory uh, landscape is very, very complex. Yes. yes. Uh, Sepp Salminen from the University of Turku also wanted to comment uh, Colette Short's uh, idea is exactly right. If you need to be very specific, and also not when you when when you when you first assess the novelty, is it on the QPS list of the EFSA? Is it something that's already acceptable for for food use, or is it something where you have to go through the novel food evaluation? It's a very important first step when you start developing something. And the second second one, I think from uh, from my experience, it's important that. When you plan your studies, you read the regulation. You still see people asking for prevention. And it's by that one word, it's not acceptable. You, you need to focus on your risk reduction, not prevention, and not biomarkers, but risk factors, because the regulation clearly tells that you need generally accepted risk factors and a change in them. So I think it's also important that anybody who is involved with this reads carefully both the regulation and the guidance document. And then I think, as Colette was saying, it, it clears your path forward. Yeah, may, maybe on that, um, Eric Chaput from Oligos, uh, very interesting on risk factors, but maybe EFSA should establish something as how can we demonstrate that something is a risk factor and we have no guidance on that and another point maybe from my experience on on claims applications um, i think one of the points that is a uh, let's say blocking at the moment is uh, the black box of the mechanism of action because if we look at um, efsa approved health claims most of them are based on it's a simple mechanism of actions that can be, uh, for example, for fiber. A, that's the mechanical mechanism of action which are accepted for laxation, for example. Uh, but the issue we have with, uh, let's say, gut microbiome modulators is that 
we have to admit that we don't know much on how it works now. And and this morning we had a presentation on uh, um, vitamin B9 and uh, neural tube defects, and that was exactly the same. We have this black box that is existing, uh, and I think that's something we need to um, to accept and to work on in order that EFSA accepts also some claims applications in, in this field. Thank you. Um, we have time for just uh, one quick question more. I just had have a comment about what is just said about the gap of information about the mechanistics. What I really think what is happening is that there's a gap between the relationship with the people that produce data and the mechanism and the industrial partners or the big clinical trials. So for my side, I work in a laboratory where we work on the mechanistics of how probiotics can be good for human health or for health in general. Mm -hmm. And there is this gap between how can we translate our knowledge mm -hmm. to be implemented in the human health. Mm -hmm. So it was just that yeah. comment. Thank well, you. Thank you. And I think that's the big question that's raised uh, by this particular panel. Um, I think the foundation, Mary Yu, is testing our immunotolerance to caffeine because we have, a, we have another coffee break right now for the next um, um, half an hour. So I'd like to take this time to thank our panel and um, <clears throat> bring up some of the challenging issues of the regulatory environment, demonstrating sa safety and efficacy of are these food items, are they medical items, and I think um, it was a very rich discussion. So uh, thank you very much to uh, our panels, um, Sandra, Subop, um, Patrice, and Marie, and thank you again.